God compares an akazu so that my household can be full. So when a principality brings government, you need another agent to compare people to come. You can build a church but to be empty. The Lord was speaking to himself. You know, there are times I was sharing with my people on Sunday and I told them, there are works that God delegates to angels. But there are certain works that God does himself. Creation is one of them. You can't delegate that assignment to any being because nobody has the blueprint. In fact, the codes are locked in the Godhead. Only God knows it. Creation is one of it. Redemption is another. These assignments, you can't, de you can't delegate them. Only God can do them. Because we we're dealing with a subject, people ask questions. They say, God is not married. How can God have a son? You, have you heard such things before? <laughs> you know, essentially speaking, God is one being. But in manifestation, he takes three forms. Because he has an administration that only him can actualize. So God has to manifest in different forms so that God can run God's errand. <laughs> in order for God to run God's errand. Because if you send an angel to create, an angel will become creator. So when the way God works is, God is sitting. And when God speaks, you know, I'm talking, you are hearing sound. But when God speaks, the voice of God walks. The Bible said in Genesis 3, 8, it said the voice of God came walking in the garden. So when God speaks, it's not volume. When God speaks, the voice of God is a person. So the God that sits on the throne, who originates the voice, is called Father. The one that goes out to walk is called Son. So it's not about wife and husband. It's a, a separation that is captured within spiritual intelligence. You, you don't have to marry to have a child. Even in biology, we know that Amoeba can divide into two. And both is the same. Are you following this? So, the, the, the mysteries are much. Now, when God wanted to extend his possibilities outside of himself, he decided to create an entity that will mirror him. And that was when man came into the scene. And so in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, God speaking, he said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness and so when you want to find God outside of God the only place you should trace him is a man let us make man in our own image after our likeness and so too much is locked into the human vessel one of our major responsibilities as we walk through time is to tap into the frequency of our inner man and draw out the resources of God that is locked there but you see, this assignment is not wished. It's a responsibility. And that's why the theme of the conference is let the river flow. Because greatness is not for irresponsible people. You have to let the river flow. First Thessalonians 5.5, 5, he said, you are the children of light. So every one of us here is light. But not everyone shines. For you to shine... Matthew 5 16 say let your light shine because you born to shine he was a burning and a shining light so if you don't take responsibility you can't manifest so the call of this conference first of all is to show you who you are and to show you how to release what you carry if you don't know who you are you can't release what you carry and if you know who you are then you take responsibility to release what you carry. So you have not come to this conference except as you begin to understand man from another dimension. Because some of the things we know about ourselves is what circumstance told us. But I came to tell you what your designer said. Because the one who knows you best is the one who sculpted you. He said you were fearfully and wonderfully made. In Ephesians 2.10, he said we are God's craftsmanship. We were created in Christ Jesus unto every good works. I came to tell you by the authority of scripture that everything you have gone through is a mirage. That's not who you are. The identity you command is the one God said. And by the time we are done routing what God said, then we will find out what to do in order to manifest what God said. Because everyone seated here, listen, you are not supposed 
to do your best. You are supposed to manifest God. Because what you call your best may not be good enough. But when you manifest God, it will be well enough. Because somebody can say he's doing his best. His best is at the level of his education. His best is at the level, like God's servant was sharing, at the level of help that he has received from men. All of that is good. But when God created us, he wanted us to manifest him. So when God comes, he's not primarily looking for your best. He's looking for himself in what you are doing. You are supposed to manifest God in everything you do because the raw material for your making is God. He said we were created in Christ Jesus unto every good works. God breathed out of his spirit and the man became a living soul. So you are supposed to give expression. That's why Paul said, henceforth, know we, no man after the flesh. You carry something that your generation is looking for. And until that thing manifests, whatever you are doing is not good enough. There are many people doing great things, but there's no God signature there. That is not good enough. Until God can be seen through you, you have not begun to exist. And this conference is designed to make sure that the God dimension in you begins to find expression. Now, when I looked at the scripture, I saw some of the records of the patriarchs. And I told myself, this thing we are doing is either it's a joke or we have not understood what God is expecting. Because the testimony of this man is so superior natural that if we are not careful in our generation the bible will be called a book of fairies we'll make the scripture look like fairy tales because our disadvantage will make it look as if what was said in time past were not true and when people read the bible they will say they are fictions because the only reason they will believe what was said two thousand years ago is if we can manifest it now so the same way the Bible is a witness, you too are a witness. That's why Jesus said, go into all the world and be witnesses unto me. So on one side, the world is witness. On another side, we are also witnesses. But we can't witness until the rivers begin to flow. Romans 15 verse 4, it said, the things that were written aforetime, it said they were written for our land. So that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Before I show you the rivers of your spirit. Let me show you some of the things that were manifested before you came. Because if you are not careful. You will think what you are offering is all God has to offer. A generation has demonstrated something before we came. And as far as God's calendar is concerned. We should manifest superior dimensions. Because it's from glory to glory. If we can manifest what they have manifested, then we are in trouble already. This is why everybody here must become dangerously deliberate about manifesting God. Genesis 14, verse 14 to 15, we saw the life of Abraham. One man had 318 trained servants. What economic structure was he working with? That was a city in one man's house. Those were servants. And they had enough to train servants. Today we are struggling with one nanny. We can't pay our children's school fees. And we are serving the same God. There is something we don't understand. Abraham was going to fight against four kings with servants he trained in his house they had competence that was superior to armies trained by four different nations because he was not just working with principles he had mysteries if you read verse 15 of that scripture the bible said and abraham divided himself among men so the people who went to war were not 318 servants plus abraham there were 319 abrahams he had the technology. He divided himself among men. A theologian can say they grouped themselves into four. That's not what the Bible is saying. 
This was a technology of priesthood that Abraham caught. God told him, I will bless you and make you a great nation. And from you, nation shall be born. So Abraham knew he was not a man. Abraham knew that worst case, he was a nation. So if Abraham put himself in you, then you too become a nation. That's why there was no record that there was casualty. Because it was 319 nations against four nations. What did the man know? Where did he enter in God that made him wield that level of power? And here we are struggling with people who are inconsequential and we call it warfare. What battles are we fighting? One man stood up without any prior information. They have arrested your nephew Lot. Four kings have taken him. Hey, stand up. 318 servants stood up and they went to battle. Defeated them and came back. When the king wanted to gift him, he said, no, I won't take a latchet from you. Lest you say you made Abraham rich. My wealth comes from yonder. My God supplies my need. I'm richer than the nations of the earth. What did he know? These are the men who came before we showed up. So when you are telling God, this battle is too much. Ten people have gone up against me. Say ten people. Did you read about your fathers? One took four nations who are ten men. That's why he said, surely they shall gather, but it shall not be by me. Every tongue that rises up against you in judgment. He didn't say God shall condemn. No. He said thou shall condemn. Thou shall condemn. Because there is something that passes through your spiritual genealogy. One man can take four kings. That's the lineage we come from. We come from a lineage of champions. A man took four nations. And that's not all. After Abraham, Moses showed up. And Moses was trying to do it in the flesh. They said, that's a wrong protocol. Go back to the mountain. There was something Abraham saw. There was a being Abraham encountered. There was a dimension Abraham stepped into. And when Jethro, who is of the descendants of Abraham from Keturah, who understood priesthood saw that Moses had passion he told him this thing is beyond passion go and encounter Elohim and the Bible said Moses went to the backside of the wilderness there he saw a bush burning that was not consumed and he said I will turn aside to see this and suddenly he heard take off thy sandals where you are standing is holy ground the mortars walk here cherubims walk here princes of Zion walk here this is where Elohim dwells take off thy sandals and immediately he followed the new protocol and they told him you don't need extra weapon the staff you have is enough drop it he dropped it it became a serpent pick it by the tail he picked it go you have been fortified what is going on here the man had been changed in exodus 7 verse 1 behold i have made thee a god unto pharaoh so there are men who are god over other men i'm telling you true that's the lineage we come from the hidden are not our contemporaries they are our servants and the guy showed up and shut down the biggest civilization of his era he comes to Pharaoh the Lord of the Hebrews have sent me let my people go that they may serve me Pharaoh thinks it's a joke don't worry you look for me the next day a plague shows up and after the ninth plague Moses showed up and said you will not see me again I come here to see you is a privilege. You will never see me again. And true to his words, he was never seen. And when Moses was leaving, can we celebrate those? <laughs> Suddenly, sir, the visible Shekinah, Exodus 13, 21, began to walk with an ordinary man. God was escorting him out of Egypt. And he said, the pillar of cloud went after him in the day and the pillar of fire by night. The guy shows up before a sea. There was no canoe. That's what we call an emergency. And he turned to the Lord. They said, why are you turning to me? There is something in your hand. Stretch forth your rod. I'm telling you why you must let the river flow. You carry more than enough for any crisis of life. Stretch forth thy rod. When he stretched the rod, he didn't know what was happening in heaven. See, when what is in you moves, heaven moves. And when he stretched the rod, the Bible said, with a blast of his nostrils, he parted the Red Sea. 
and over four million men walk through on dry ground and you think that is all they enter a wilderness no economic structure no security structure how do you sustain four million people they needed water speak to the rock do rock have ears as if that is not enough their clothes didn't tear their shoes grew with them a child of seven months they make a shoe he's 30 years he's still using the same shoe because shoe too has technology of compression and compliance under the glory that's the heritage we come from that's why when we tell you our god sustains men we are not psyching you there are testimonies in scripture he said the things that were written aforetime they were written for our learning if you can trust god sir it's not fairy tale men have proven his faithfulness they proved his faithfulness and that's not all you read the chronicles and you keep seeing them joshua shows up joshua chapter 10 from verse 12 to 14 fighting in a battle joshua saw that when it is night they will be disadvantaged and the man stood up and said let the sun stand upon the mountains of ajalon let the moon remain upon the valley of gibeon and the bible said the man didn't even pray he was commanding the constellations the Bible said the sun did not make haste to go down in the day that God hearkened to the voice of a man. If this is the heritage we have received, then it's either we have not known it or what we are doing is a joke. Over my life, oh Yahweh. Over my life, oh Yahweh. Let only you be praised. 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 Hmm. I read about Samuel. I almost started weeping. The Bible said in 1 Samuel chapter 7, from verse 12, a nation thought Israel was weak. They found where to plunder. And when they, it's time for harvest, they come and loot them. And suddenly, the army was incapacitated and they ran to a prophet. A prophet has no gun. He has no arrow, but he has an altar. The Bible says, somewhere erected a stone. What do these people know? He poured oil on it and he called it Ebenezer. And he said, he tell to us, the Lord helped us. And the Bible said, from that day, the hand of God was perpetually against the Philistines. And he said, even the land that the Philistines took from the Israelites were restored to them up on the Ekron. They began to enter their own corridors because somebody did something on the altar. That's the heritage we have received. What did this man encounter? What has happened? Because these things trouble my spirit. You know why? In the realm of witches, they preserve their heritage. If they tell you witches go for meeting in the night by flight, it's the same hundred years ago, it's the same now. They maintain their heritage. But when we read the stories of the Bible and we compare it with our present situation, it looks as if we are worshipping different gods. Meanwhile, our God is the same yesterday, today and forever. What is wrong? What is wrong? Why don't we have hunger and appetite for these things anymore? God's servant was sharing concerning Daniel recently. Daniel was in the city of corruption. Babylon is a land of corruption. But the Bible said in Daniel 1.8, he proposed in his heart that he will not be defied by the portion of the king's meat. And there was no corruption there that affected him. Today you meet Christians even if it's a bucket of water, we fall inside and we drown. Everybody is struggling with every kind of sin. If you talk, they say it's not easy. It's not easy. You, in fact, people don't believe they are righteous men today. When you are talking, they say, oh, more relax. This thing is no, no, forget those things. It's a lie. As if holiness is now alien to our generation. Meanwhile, the testimony of our fathers is such that they walked through Babylon, they were not defied. 
So much so that they had to gang up to set him up. Yet the man said he will not bow. And when they were to throw them into the fire, they said, Oh king, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. Holiness is unquestionable. There's no ground for compromise. If you like, throw us into the fire. Our God is able to save us. But in case he chooses not to, we will still not bow. And because of their witness, the Spirit of God came upon them. In Daniel chapter 5 from verse 11 to 14, when the testimony of Daniel was told, it was not a Christian that wrote the Chronicles. It was the hidden queen that spoke about him. He said, there's a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. He said, light and understanding is in him and he has the power to explain hard sentences. Go and call him. And the guy shows up without reading any book. He began to tell the king parables of the ancients. He said, God showed favor to your father, gave you a kingdom, and you decide to worship the God of Ayo. He said, that's why this hand came. How do you know where the hand came from? Who taught you the language? Where have you been going to? Now we understand the reason he was superior to Babylon. Because he walked in a civilization that was older and more ancient than Babylon. He said, mene, mene. Take care of a sin. He said, your kingdom has been weighed on the balances. Who told you they weigh men? This is where we are coming from. What we are doing here has a history. What we are doing has a foundation. And there are men who embody the testimonies. That what we are doing is not just religion. We are not fanatics. We have a culture. We have a heritage. We come from a civilization. And we have testimonies to prove the reality and the veracity of that civilization. The names continue on ending. Is it Elijah you want to talk about? A man walks to a palace and said, As surely as I live, there shall be no rain or dew except by my word. Do you control weather? And you look at him, you think he's a madman. He walks away. Three months later, you discover he was not bluffing. And the king and all of his servants began to look for Elijah for two years. When they eventually found Elijah, Elijah said, Go and tell the king and come in. Obadiah said, God knows I will leave you. Because we know that you don't travel with chariots. We know you don't travel with horses. You travel with wear wind. How, how did you know that technology? At that time. If I leave you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you. We know you. You will be trapped. You are like the wind. Meanwhile, this is what Jesus was telling us in John chapter 3. That as the wind blew it. Before Jesus said it, Elijah was walking in it. Moving like the whirlwind is a heritage. Aeons before Jesus came is a cause to be normal. The cause. That's why everything overwhelms us. Everything wearies us out. We don't know what we have been called into. We have been summoned into that which is as ancient as God. And there are testimonies to that effect. When the New Testament story began, the standard was never lowered. The Bible spoke concerning Peter. A point came, there was no need praying for the sick. Put them on the streets. When they come out of the prayer hall, you know, that's why I tell our generation, prayer is not about sweating. It's about tapping into your heritage in Christ. When these men went to pray, if they come out, it's not they sweat on their suit. When you pray, you will sweat. But they came with the witness of heaven. In Acts 5.15, they put the sick on the road. Who told them? That means if you have somebody in the hospital and they told you Peter is coming, quickly go and discharge him. Today, they will tell you, doctors will tell you, don't hear what any pastor tells you. We are advising you, better take your drug. And if you try it, you will see something. But in the days of Peter, when he's passing, they will carry people from the village, put them on the street. He doesn't need to lay hands. 
when his shadow touches them whatever they call that sickness it is cleansed they knew something they had something Paul was speaking in 2nd Corinthians 11 from verse 25 he had suffered shipwreck three times Paul said a day and a half I was in the deep the man fell into the river he refused to die he became like an aquatic creature a day and a half I was in the deep he cheated death because he carried something that could tell death go back but here we are every day somebody said we will die we already have high blood pressure but these were men that defied death. When he couldn't walk, they, they gathered him physically, stoned him to death. The Bible said the believers stood around him. He stood up. He said, let's go to the next city. What did they carry? What is in them? I want to tell you what is in them. It's the Holy Ghost. And that is the confidence that we have. If they manifested it, we must manifest it. And we will manifest more. Because the Bible said, behind them is a desolate wilderness. But before them is the garden of the Lord. That means everything they did is a rehearsal for what we will do. A generation is about to rise that will walk in the order that Christ himself walked in. Because he said, the works that I do, he said, you shall do also. He said, and greater works than this shall ye do.